just uh, work out how this works. Look at that. Okay. So optimum gut health is actually absolutely fundamental to good performance. If we don't have that gut in good order, we've got no chance at all of actually extracting full performance. The gut's quite a comprehensive uh, organ within the body. Not only does it process the food to derive the nutrients necessary for growth, but it also is a major defense barrier against pathogens and it is the largest immune organ in the body. It must be maintained in good order or one, if not all of those functions will be compromised. So it's a very important prerequisite for good performance is to keep good order in the gut. And the way we measure or, or quantitate the, the status of uh, uh, gut integrity is usually by the morphology of that gut. And we term, tend to talk about the, um, here we go, the, uh, the villus height here, these finger-like projections that do the absorbing within the gut relative to the depth of the crypt here, which is the cellular replacement uh, area within the gut that maintains the regrowth uh, of that tissue. And while we have a healthy gut, we have long villi expressed here over the shorter crypts, and we have a, a ratio there that uh, indicates good health. And conversely, when we look at a gut over here that's been severely damaged and had the villi sloughed off, you can see that the ratio here between the villus height and the crypt depth is much smaller than it would be in a healthy gut. And the extent of that damage is measured by the shift in that ratio. But it's not just a question of losing the absorptive surface that, that is the problem in the gut. It's, there's many other complications, as we've heard from the previous speakers today. And one of this is the um, translocation of bacteria and bacterial toxins out of the lumen of the gut through this damaged tissue, through the weakened uh, tight junctions here, um, or as Nick mentioned, through the cells themselves, into the underlying tissue. And then we get this sort of inflammatory response here as these things, these foreign materials start to invade the tissue. And once we get that inflammatory reaction, then we, the animal's in serious bother because not only has it had this uh, anorexic effect of reduced intake, it's also got a, a reduced absorptive capacity and so its nutrient supply is compromised. And at the same time, what little nutrient does get through is now being challenged into an immune response rather than being diverted to growth. And so this is something we really do need to avoid. We really need to maintain the gut in good order if we're going to make progress. And so I guess it's fundamental for all people. We like to see animals in very comfortable conditions and we won't expect good performance unless they are comfortable. But this comfort is not just a question of their physical environment and their external environment. It's very much associated with the gut. Within that, it also has to be very comfortable for get good performance. So we arrange this uh, environment within the gut to some extent by what we feed that animal. And we formulate feeds with the knowledge that we are going to influence that to some extent and we have to be fairly considerate. If we describe what the purpose of feed formulation was, we could say that it's the compilation of feed ingredients to meet the nutrient requirements of the animal, and I guess in its basic form, that's what it is. But in the process of that, we have to recognize the digestive limits and tolerances of the gastrointestinal tract and work within those limits. Feed formulation has many aspects, and they're not only just uh, related to the animal. There's many practical aspects in feed milling that need to be addressed as well. The primary aim, of course, is to meet the nutrient specifications of the, of the animal, to put together a diet that will uh, hopefully extract full performance from them. And we have to consider the palatability and the digestibility of the specific materials. If the material is not palatable and the pigs won't eat it, it's academic, whether it's balanced or not, because they're not going to get the nutrients. If the digestibility is poor, then they won't extract the nutrients that we've delivered or if the digestibility is just slow, it will limit intake. And so we need to enhance both palatability and digestibility to get the delivery of these nutrients that we've packed into that diet in the first instance. But then there's physical aspects of the diet as well and how it flows and lends itself for processing in the feed mill. If we have a diet that hangs up or won't pellet or has other issues, then it's incumbent on the nutritionist to change the formulation to 
facilitate the process to some extent. So it is extra factors that they often have to consider beyond the initial uh, nutrient specifications that were set. And there's also consideration to the additivity and overlaps that occur with various raw material combinations. While you're working with corn soy, it's probably not a major issue, but as we've just heard in Western Europe and certainly in Australia, we work with a broad range of raw materials and we have to be very sensitive and cognizant of those um, additivity factors and the nickability of particular ingredients. We certainly have to be aware of the compatibility of feed additives. Many feed additives are presented to us as, as uh, ideal to uh, or achieve a certain function, but un unfortunately they are often contraindicated with another one that would also be useful and you really can't use them together at the same time. So we have to be aware of how these things work and how they fit. We also often have to make best use of available raw materials, which is distinct from being least cost formulation. And often we're pressured into using up materials that we're committed to, or having to work with limited materials we'd rather use more of, but just can't get. But for all these other factors, two that really stand out that we really can't put a quantitative figure on when we're formulating, but we really certainly have to have it in the back of our mind, is that part of the function is to maintain the stability of the microflora in the gut, and in doing so, maintain the gut integrity. If we do anything to disturb that uh, balance, um, we're going to be in trouble. And many of these aspects that I've mentioned here involve judgments on the nutritionist's behalf on a plane above the simple uh, linear programming of feed formulation. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's more of an art almost at times to feed formulation than there is science. But we'd like to think that there's a marriage of those two things and we can consistently produce a, an acceptable article. When it comes down to ingredient selection, we certainly recognise that certain ingredients can represent a challenge uh, to particular pigs. And vulnerability to these is often a function of maturity, and certainly young pigs with an immature gut require materials to be selected on an ease of digestion basis. And so we have to be a bit more particular about what we choose to use. And certainly on the carbohydrate side here, we tend to use more processed and simple carbohydrates like cooked cereals and sugars, etc. We're looking for high quality animal proteins uh, to, to provide the uh, am amino acids in many instances, things like fish and blood, plasma, meat products where we are allowed to use them. But certainly milk remains the, 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 the prime product that we'd prefer to use, except that it's too expensive and uh, isn't available to us. But pigs certainly make good use of things like lactose and casein and whey proteins and milk fat. In fact, the piglet is designed to run on fat. Its mother's milk is 40% uh, fat on a dry matter basis. And so it can handle fat quite well. But as we shift away from milk fats to other fats, we have to be very much aware that uh, it doesn't handle other fats quite as well and we need to nom uh, monitor the chain length and the degree of saturation etc in these fats to ensure that we're not posing a challenge to that young pig that it can't accommodate. But as well as the choice of materials there's also the physical integrity of those materials. It's very important. If there's any oxidative damage, rancidity, putrefaction, ammonia etc all of these can be a potential source of irritation in the gut and, and destabilise it. And when it comes to things like creep feeding, although we design very uh, expensive diets at times to achieve a very specific nutrient delivery, much of the purpose of creep feeding, I believe, is to do with the exposure um, of the piglet to feed and bacterial antigens, um, more so than supplying nutrients necessarily. It's giving it an opportunity to have a look at these things while it's under the protection of the passive immunity from its mother and then uh, recognise those antigens so that when it is weaned and set on its own, it's, got the, um, it's more prepared, I guess, to deal with these things in due course. And this controlled antigen exposure is very important. If we don't prepare the piglet and he suffers a severe uh, episode at the point of weaning, this can have a long, whole-of-life uh, detrimental effect. And uh, Kelly and King here have expressed it as an excessive regulatory or effector immune functions at weaning can result in a long-term inability to mount an appropriate response to mucosal antigens. 
So often many of the problems that we find happening in finisher pigs isn't as a consequence of what we do with them as finishers, it's some of the inappropriate things we may have done right back at weaning. And so there are a number of various feed additives out there that we can use to suppress the pathogenicity of the microbes that they're experiencing and even though we don't necessarily fully eliminate them, we allow them the opportunity to recognize the antigens for future reference. And the sort of ingredients that we can use for this purpose are things like spray dried plasma, hyperimmunized egg proteins, zinc and copper additives, although they're probably falling from grace to some extent at the moment. Certainly phytogenics has become to the fore in this regard and yeast fractions and organic acids. They all work through either uh, bactericidal, bacteria static, bacterial binding or anti-inflammatory uh, properties that just help to buffer down the situation and allow uh, an orderly recognition of the antigens. We have a number of formulation constraints that we apply and many of these are quite arbitrary and, and are down to the individual nutritionist. They're uh, he often reflect his local knowledge and, and experience and, and his risk management approach. And so we often get differences of opinion of uh, just how extreme we can be with our selection of materials. But the sort, pardon me, the sort of things we're looking for uh, in those materials are uh, aspects of um, digestibility, fermentation rate, palatability, potential irritants, and we have to also consider things like um, the use of synthetic amino acids and the, uh, the concept of uh, nutrient asynchrony is, is quite a significant issue and how we complement the, the composition of the diet with the feeding management that we apply. And so we ensure that we get um, an orderly uh, presentation of the uh, amino acids we intend at the tissue level rather than arriving out of sync because we've got an imbalance between the level of synthetic acid, uh, amino acids and the rate of digestion or release of amino acids from uh, uh, entire protein. From a nutrient point of view, there's many uh, specifications that we set in the diet for you know, uh, a, a nutritional uh, consideration, but there's also additional factors at times that we also need to consider. And fibre is an interesting one. For, for the early part of uh, my time in, in feeding pigs, we always considered fibre to be a, a net negative, uh, that it was basically a diluent and that it interfered with digestion of other components and that we tried to manage it uh, downwards. But in more recent times, of course, we realise that fibre plays far more, uh, a bigger role in, in gut health and certainly has a, a function as a prebiotic in many instances it can be physically stimulating to the gut and offers quite a degree of protection. So even in very young pigs, there's a very uh, significant role for fibre in the diet, uh, independent of any um, uh, basic nutrient requirement as such. Things like calcium, there's a requirement for calcium, but once we've met that requirement, we have to consider other aspects. And one of the other components is, of course, that it does have a, uh, an effect on the acid binding capacity of the feed and any excess calcium there in, in that instance is going to actually interfere with the acid secretion from the pig and uh, create a, a problem in, in maintaining gastric pH, etc. So calcium level also we found is in more recent times has been inhibitory towards the efficacy of uh, phytase. And so we need to manage the calcium uh, tolerance range uh, for that reason, quite independent of the pig's requirement for calcium. Things like fats, as I mentioned, the question of digestibility, the level of saturation in those fats and how well the pig can digest them. And more interesting, and I'll show you a little bit of data shortly about this uh, omega-6, omega-3 ratio. This is something that's come to the fore in the last two or three years that we never previously considered, but has a profound effect on, on the uh, performance of pigs. Salt, very common component, and we deliver sodium. Sodium is very important. Young pigs in particular have a significant sodium requirement. It will affect their appetite if it's not delivered. But in doing that, we need to manage the total electrolyte balance in the diet so we don't create any uh, osmotic tension in, in the gut uh, as a consequence of those uh, uh, additional salts. 
There's anti-nutritional factors we have to consider, tannins and alkaloids and even non-starch polysaccharides that occur in a lot of the grains we use. And so we, we need to be cognizant of those and take steps to either limit their inclusion in the diet or provide mechanisms to hydrolyze them or deactivate them. And we've had this debate about protein here. There's certainly a, a requirement for a minimum amount of protein to meet the amino acid requirements, etc. But there's also an issue with uh, overdoing the protein and creating problems, particularly with the indigestible fractions that flow into the hindgut and then create a bacterial proliferation. In the past, or up until fairly recent times, we've enjoyed the use of uh, antibiotics, I guess, in the feed as a means of controlling this gut stability. And now that antibiotics have come into focus and are being withdrawn out of the equation, we're having to come up with alternative methods of controlling the uh, bug population in the gut. And we're looking for other antimicrobial uh, components that can help us regulate that uh, uh, microbial environment. Dominant amongst these, of course, are the acids that we can use and we've been using them extensively for some time but they're coming more to the fore now as, as a major component of the uh, tools we have available. And these come in many forms. We have the mineral acids like hydrochloric and phosphoric. These are fairly severe acids. Many people don't like using them from an occupational health and safety point of view but they are very effective in pulling down the pH, particularly in liquid feeds. Mostly, though, people will be sort of turning to the organic acids and things like lactic, citric, formic, etc., benzoic. And um, others that we can use are the volatile fatty acids, the normal fermentation acids, uh, more common to ruminants, but acetic, propionic, butyric acid are all very helpful as well in terms of their antibacterial influence. And many of these we've had in the system for thousands of years. People have been using these things like sour milk or lactic acid to control scales, or citric acid as lemon juice, or acetic acid as vinegar, as old age remedies for dealing with um, uh, scouring piglets. So it's not new, it's just a, a refocus of uh, getting these things to work better. And what we've found is that certain combinations of these and various forms in terms of protected or coated forms to target the activity within the gut or uh, the salts of some of these acids in combination with the free acid work very well. The other form of acids that are useful are these medium chain fatty acids as we heard of before from largely from uh, coconut sources etc or palm and these are the um, C6 to C12 carbon uh, acids and they have a very particular useful property of being able to perforate the cells of bacterial uh, walls or the, the, the bacterial cell wall and allow the uh, other um, organic acids to penetrate and dissociate and do their work. And the mode of action of these acids is largely through two directions. Firstly, there's the pH effect or the hydrogen effect and then there's the, as they dissociate, you get the anion effect or the toxic anions. And this is formic acid, dissociates into hydrogen and formate. And uh, both of those are particularly toxic to the bacterial cells. So formic acid is a particularly good uh, form of uh, antimicrobial uh, additive uh, within the feed. But when we look at, uh, pardon me, the uh, supplementary acids in, uh, uh, in pigs, in the young pig in particular, there's this aspect of acid binding that we have to be mindful of. The acid secretion in the young pig is quite limited. Optimum gastric pH is hard to maintain. It's often aggravated by high acid binding foodstuffs like limestone, zinc oxide, dicalfos and protein. And so we need to be formulating to limit these in the diet to give the, any a supplementary acid half a chance to work. And the acids are, are multi-faceted uh, here in terms that they, they have multiple functions. Firstly, they can be in the feed to tidy up the hygiene of the feed and, and deal with pathogens before it even gets to the animal. They can then maintain a, uh, be used to maintain the pH uh, gastric barrier. And if we can keep the pH of that stomach below 4, then we can largely eliminate uh, E. coli and salmonella, who are 
somewhat intolerant of pHs below that level. It also is helpful to maintain the uh, pH in the gut in a range that supports optimum enzyme efficiency and particular amongst these is, is the uh, you know, protein hydrolysis enzymes which are the conversion of the pepsinogen as it's secreted into the active form pepsin. This requires a low pH to occur. If it doesn't occur then protein digestion is compromised and this can then set the stage for uh, further problems as that undigested material flows further down the gut. We need to create a more comfortable environment uh, with these acids too for the com uh, favourable commensal bacteria, the lacto lactic acid bacteria and the bifidus species, which are the natural and uh, preferred inhabitants, I guess, of the gut. And it can then take direct ac antibacterial action too to control uh, other pathogens, as I mentioned, by the, the combination of pH and, and the toxic anion aspects of the acid. Um, it is also known to stimulate pancreatic function uh, through improved digestion and also to, to uh, assist in the immune fu function. Other uh, alternative antimicrobials that have been used are things like zinc oxide and copper sulfate and they have served us reasonably well over the years. Uh, they have largely fallen from grace now as I mentioned, uh, largely because of environmental pollution and, and other issues but not least of which is the fact that they have been associated with actually uh, inducing uh, my, uh, antibiotic resistance uh, in the animal. So that is a, a bit of a problem in itself that you can in actually induce the anti uh, anti um, antibiotic resistance not by using the antibiotics but by using these compounds in lieu of them and still ending up with the same problem. Um, phytobiotics, this is a, a, a big area that's uh, come to the fore. Again, if you look through the uh, compounds that are listed here as being effective in this regard and the materials that they're derived from, there's a lot of ancient um, materials here that have been used for a long time. These go back again, as I said, for thousands of years and they've been known in the human area as a, a digestive, as a calming agent for the gut, as an improvement of digesting uh, food, of, of settling down uh, gastric disorders, etc. So big future here for these and it's just a question of sorting out um, past history of what works and what doesn't and exploring other avenues and certainly biomen have put a big effort, R&D effort into sorting out and exploring these avenues and their um, digesterom range is, is probably um, starting to show some very effective performance in the field and I think there's a lot more to come um, from these in due course. They sit very well as a very natural um, form of control. They may not be absolutely as effective as um, antibiotics, but they are an extra tool that we have in the, in the uh, lineup there to help us um, manage the, the gut flora. They have a broad range of uh, modes of action in there, there's, they are antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, they stimulate digestive functions, the bacteriostatic, immune modulation, etc. And all sorts of different functions which we can, by selecting combinations, hopefully can come up with products that are very focused in their effect in the pigs. Another area, of, another tool set that we have here is probiotics, where we can actually put in live bacteria to colonise the gut and stabilise the environment in there and uh, the sort of bacteria that we use for this are lactobacillus, bifidus, bacillus species and live yeast and by occupying those uh, sites within the gut we can hopefully eliminate or reduce the amount of uh, attachment from uh, pathogens that are ingested by competitive exclusion and from other uh, mechanisms that they have like organic acid production to um, deal with these other pathogens and make their life difficult. We can promote those probiotics by the use of prebiotics and the sort of compounds we have available here are things like inulin and uh, mannan oligosaccharides and fructo oligosaccharides, beta glucans and slow release fermentable wood fibres. These are all very helpful in stimulating, feeding, maintaining this target population that we're trying to get to establish in the gut and to stabilising that environment uh, very effectively. 
Phytogenics, as I mentioned, I think is, is we're going to see a lot more of these in the near future. And they're commonly used, not necessarily on their own, but in combination with organic acids. And they, they can provide very effective uh, pathogen control and stability. And what we're aiming for is this eubiosis, this stability or peace in the gut, as distinct from dysbiosis, where it's in turmoil and, uh, and a challenge to the animal. Certainly when the bacterial population in the gut proliferates or the degree of diversity is reduced, there is a greater risk of irritation, inflammation and gut damage. And uh, we, we really you know, do need to avoid that if, uh, if we're going to be successful in, in commercial operations. And they can also be used to stimulate the pancreas and regulate appetite and, and reduce inflammation as I mentioned. Other compounds that we have been using but also now become part of the armory as well are just simple things like enzymes. We've always used enzymes to try and get better extraction of the nutrients out of the food that we've applied but what we're looking for now is a different approach in as much that we're trying to eliminate the indigestible fractions that tumble into the hindgut of the pig and, and then cause a bacterial proliferation. So by strategic use of enzymes we can actually lower the food source um, for the uh, lower gut bacteria and keep and manage their um, populations down there by essentially uh, starving them of, of uh, nutrients. Functional foods, um, as I mentioned, there's things like spray-dried plasma and uh, egg-derived antibodies um, and certainly nucleotides. These are all very helpful uh, aspects to, to help gut stability um, through different functions, either their anti-inflammatory aspects or their direct uh, immunoglobulin contribution into the gut, etc., are very helpful. And certainly in the case of nucleotides, the, the nucleic acids from the DNA and RNA from uh, yeast extract, etc., very valuable in promoting the immune development of the pig itself and allowing it to mount its own defence uh, procedures in due course. And often we see the application of nucleotides in the young pig's life has a profound effect on the whole of life and so the, the benefits actually come later uh, than necessarily around the time of application. Mentioned mananolagosaccharides before as a, um, a probiotic but it also has other properties or certain ones of them have properties of being actually able to bind bacteria and bacterial toxins and, and carry them out of the gut so they don't interfere uh, with the animal essentially. And that's another useful um, property um, that's been exploited by a number of commercial products. And of course we have things to deal with other uh, stressful aspects within the diet, antioxidants, mould inhibitors, mycotoxin binders. We've seen today some of the negative effects of mycotoxins uh, in, the, in the system and how um, damaging they can be. But it's not just additives that we really need to concern ourselves with. There are aspects of feeding management that are also important in maintaining gut health. And probably one of my favourite uh, issues in the field, I guess, is this question of uh, feed irregularity or out-of-feed events. The, the, the lumen, uh, the um, mucosal cells in the gut actually feed themselves largely out of the lumen of the gut. And when the gut is empty, they start to starve and as they start to starve the gut architecture starts to fall, to fall apart. And so the best way to prevent that sort of stress in the gut is to keep the animal on feed. And so we find that a lot of episodes uh, in terms of um, gastric disturbance or, or enteric disturbance come about actually from poor feed management and letting pigs run out of feed and then gorging when they sort of uh, reallimate. Um, there's also a question in formulation about diet continuity, both over time and by diet. So as we go through the sequence from wiener grower finisher, etc., we don't want to see major changes in the, the uh, substrates that we use because these do change the microflora of the gut and can be quite disturbing. Feed hygiene is also another pet hate of mine. Um, we often don't pay enough attention to it, whether the feed's stored in silos in bulk at the farm or whether it's in bags in the, more in the Asian environment 
often it can deteriorate quite significantly and yet still gets fed to animals and still causes problems. And what we're trying to avoid by this management is this risk of dysbiosis, the gut damage, the depressed immune system and subsequent vulnerability to other diseases. We've just seen a um, quiet debate here about protein and it's interesting. I, uh, I don't know if the sow herself uh, listens to some of those comments, but uh, she has no trouble providing a 25% protein diet to her piglets. And I don't think protein per se is necessarily a major issue. It's the digestibility of that protein that's an issue. And so if all that protein disappears out of the small intestine um, by being fully digested, I don't think it's going to create much of a, a disturbance to the gut at all. But um, certainly, uh, we do need digested protein for efficient growth, but it's the undigested protein that can cause health challenges and inefficiency. So it's not per, um, protein quality or protein quantity itself that's the issue. It's partly or more to do with protein quality. So we're trying to meet the protein requirement of the pig and the gut and minimise the amount of undigested protein entering the large intestine. So simply lowering the crude protein level does not necessarily guarantee success. Okay, I better get a move on. Um, what we do need here is a lot more uh, uh, discipline about the way we formulate diets. We need to formulate for the full 10 essential amino acids if we're going to take full control. We need to formulate for standard ileal digestible amino acids and not total. We need to understand that digestibility. We need to also monitor the inadequate pool of non-essential amino acids to make sure it's fully complementary. Whoops. Oops. Uh, where am I now? Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, and also we need to take advantage of this full range of synthetic amino acids, not just the common ones of lysine, methionine, threonine, tryptophan, etc., but more to the point we're now making better use of things like isoleucine, valine, arginine, and particularly glutamine. Non-essential amino acid, but very, very helpful. Um, and certainly slow release fer fermentable fibres can be included in the diet here as an insurance against uh, protein fermentation in the large intestine. If we can't avoid the, the um, indigestible protein, at least we can do something to buffer down its effect. Um, one thing we don't, uh, or we have done in, in recent times, is come uh, develop the technology in Australia to to look at um, a very rapid assay of, of feedstuffs and their nutritional value. And we've come up with an NIR technology here that gives us the full uh, energy profile within the feeds, the amino acids, fibre aspects, and uh, NSP aspects. And it, it's been a wonderful boon to uh, helping us formulate feeds. And um, I just, because I'm short of time, I'm going to jump over that. But this is the um, service that I'm referring to, and I think if, if you would do well to um, consider looking at this, it's been taken over by um, AB Vista in the UK, and they're offering it as a worldwide service. But it's an NIR scan of feedstuffs that can tell you, in one scan, all these different properties. It gives you the protein, the fat, the various fibre fractions, starch, all the NSP fractions, the faecal digestibility of the energy, the ileal digestibility, the difference of which we can work out the net energy values of the feedstuffs, etc. It also does uh, total um, uh, amino acid profiles and, and uh, standard ileal digestible amino acids on particular feedstuffs. It's not fully developed in that regard yet, but it's a, it's a wonderful resource. When we look at the feedstuffs that we deal with in Australia, it's a, there's a very broad cross-section of materials. And it's a, it's a great asset to have that flexibility, but it's very heavy responsibility that we have to under, fully understand each of those components and how they fit together and also how they vary. And the uh, OzScan service that we've been using in recent times has given us a great ability to understand much, in much more detail each of these components and how best we can um, put them together to make effective feeds. Fats and oils, they're not all the same. They may have similar calorific value, but they certainly have other nutritional aspects that can be um, quite a problem. 
They're characterized by their chain length, their degree of saturation, and the position of the double bond. And this uh, omega-3 number is, is uh, referring to the position of the first double bond uh, from the methyl end of the carbon chain. And although omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids are both essential, uh, an imbalance between them can have severe detrimental effects. And this is largely explained through the fact that the omega-6, like linoleic and ar arachidonic, are precursors for pro-inflammatory cytokines, while the omega-3, uh, linolenic and uh, EPA and DHA from fish oils are precursors for the anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines. It's a yin and yang type effect. When it gets out of balance, it can have quite a, a, a substantial disturbance, particularly to the immune function within the animal. And there's some data here from uh, Stuart Wilkinson at Sydney Uni demonstrating this where he's taken wiener pigs, fed them a common diet. The only thing he changed was the oil source and he added either 4% tallow as a saturated fat, 4% fish oil as um, omega-3 source or 4% of safflower oil as an omega-6 source. And you can see here um, in terms of ADG, no real differences here, but a very substantial depression of performance here on this high omega-6 oil mainly due to low intake here and due to the high omega-6, omega-3 ratio. I'll go to the last slide. Okay. I'll go to the, there's a lovely picture for you. I'll show you before I go. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, and the point here, of course, is that, um, you know, when we have a, a serious problem in the gut, and this is the sort of twisted bowel enterotoxemia type problem that's common on wheat diets in Australia, um, when we get to the point where the animal is that stressed that it dies, then we can expect that there's a lot of other animals in the herd who are uncomfortable and are not performing to their full uh, capacity. So we need to monitor it. I was going to talk about uh, uh, heat stress and how to do with it, but we'll, we'll jump past that. Dietetic stress uh, is another aspect here, and certainly regulating things like salt and lactose and, and uh, uh, NSPs in the diet are, are very important, um, and providing certain additives to control that is, is very helpful in, in regulating uh, that aspect. Um, we've seen outstanding performance in pigs. We saw some from the PIC talk earlier, but we're now looking at... Um, you know, common herds in Australia being able to produce pigs at 780 grams a day from birth to slaughter with a feed conversion less than two. I think that's quite remarkable for an animal uh, the size of a pig. Starting to, to uh, approach uh, poultry or broiler uh, feed efficiencies at an animal that's much, much bigger, which is quite, quite outstanding. But to be able to achieve that, of course, the main point is here, it needs a healthy gut. And similarly on the sow side, we've got sows now who've got a, got a capacity to produce 15 litres of milk a day. They require a big intake of uh, nutrients, about 120 megajoules of energy and 75 grams of lysine to achieve that if they're going to preserve their body uh, condition. And this requires 8 kilos a day uh, intake at least. And uh, again, the main requirement here is the gut has to be in good order. So that's the... The main slide at the end of this is that uh, we go about this business of securing gut uh, stability by selecting raw materials, but we shouldn't be uh, afraid to use um, a number of different feed additives. Feed additives is not a dirty word. There's some very positive ones out there, and anything that can help to improve digestive competence, to preserve gut integrity, to extend the range of feeds that we can use, Promote gut health, well-being and production and secure our economic viability really are well worth considering. And given our nutrient, uh, or the, the role of the gut in nutrient delivery and immune protection, I would argue that it's the, probably the most uh, important organ in the body. And I have a, a, a statement here from a very uh, authority person like Napoleon who said at one stage that an army marches on its stomach. Well, I believe this is also very relevant to the pig herd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good.